Uh, one of the first play tests I had, we ran into the infinite potato problem, where the <laughs> potatoes would draw cards, and then they would get shuffled back in your deck. It's like, and the person plays like, look, I could just go through my deck over and over again. This <laughs> no. is, I was just like, yeah, no, this is broken. <laughs> Cardboard Creations, where we discuss the process, techniques, and inspiration for designing board games. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm really excited to be here today with Emma Larkins to find out how Abandon All Artichokes was created. But first, let's jump into a quick overview of how it works. Abandon All Artichokes is a fast-playing, deck-wrecking card game for two to four players where you harvest vegetables to build your deck and gain new powers while abandoning artichokes from your hand whenever possible. On your turn, you take a new vegetable card into your hand from the garden row, and then you may play any number of cards from your hand. After playing cards, you discard any unplayed cards and draw five new cards from your personal deck. When you refill your hand at the end of your turn, if none of the cards are artichokes, you immediately win the game. Hey, Emma, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's great to talk to you. I, I, you know, Lincoln and Nikki played Abandon All Artichokes on one of their game night date nights. Uh, I think it was sometime last year. I really loved all the cute artwork, but beyond that, I thought it would like had a really interesting twist on deck building, which I think is super clever. Um, while also being like this really accessible card game. So what, what initially inspired you to create Abandon All Artichokes? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words about the game. Uh, I also love the artwork and had absolutely nothing to do that. It was all Bonnie Pang, uh, the artist for Abandon All Artichokes, but it, it is so cute. Uh, I love it. So, and this question is always interesting because it actually relates to something we might be discussing in just a little bit, but Abandon All Artichokes is one of the few games I know that was name first game design. Huh. So when I was starting to work on more board games, I had a few small projects that indie projects that had been published and I was trying to make more games. And so I did this, inspirational challenge that I called Game Design Daily, where I was giving myself little fun tasks every day to try and inspire my creativity. And one of those tasks I gave myself was to write a list of alliterative game names. So ah, I was on, yeah. <laughs> nice. Exactly, I know, right? Uh, and I was on the bus on my way to work at Mox Boarding House, which is a wonderful board game store and cafe here in Seattle. And I just kind of let things flow. So stuff like obnoxious otters or muffled moms, you know, just <laughs> not even thinking about mechanics or anything. Just saying that they were game names is really a stretch, you know, just combinations of uh, three words put together, two or three words put together. One of those alliterative names was Abandonal Artichokes. I posted the list to Twitter, which I did with all of my daily challenges, and people said they wanted to buy the game. The game was just- <laughs> The game that didn't exist yet, but <laughs> that's exactly. cool. Uh, There's like, you know, shut up and take my money. I will buy Abandonal Artichokes. Out of the list of names, that was the one that kind of resonated with people. Uh, of course, I didn't do anything with it right away. It just kind of stuck in the back of my brain. Uh, but then later in the year, I gave myself another challenge to make seven prototypes in seven days and abandon all artichoke resurfaced in my brain. And this idea of a deck builder came with it because abandoning made me think of the trashing mechanic in many deck builders. And yeah, that was the inspiration. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> it's, not, it's not often you hear a story of a game that starts with the name and then the name kind of inspires the mechanisms that, you know, for the actual game design. How did you get from, you know, your initial idea of I'm going to make Abandon All Artichokes into a playable prototype? Yeah, so when I assigned myself this challenge, game a day prototype for a week, 
Uh, my goal was to, they had to be really quick, right? So doing a prototype in a day, you don't have a lot of time, but it's a great way to start, especially if you're making similar games, because one of the things I find a lot of new designers get most stuck on is, well, how do I start? How do I make the game? Right. And if you just, just, just do it is what, what right. I, I kind of try and tell people is get something down, get something on paper and you want to get it to the point where you can actually play it with someone. So with these games that I was, I wasn't just prototyping and kind of putting it on a shelf. Uh, luckily, my, my husband is also a great gamer, game player, game player very uh, patient and helpful with me. So I was putting these brand new prototypes, just making them, and then within the day, trying to actually get at least a round or two of them played. So... Got the, the artichokes, of course, were there, and a couple of card powers. Uh, I don't think any of them really stuck around, but <laughs> so I had the artichokes. Uh, the idea of the I got clip art, cart, uh, clip art from the internet. I got clip art of faces and put them on the cards. I had, I think, a banana, a strawberry. It was fruits, fruits and vegetables okay, back then. Okay, okay. Just put it all together and played it, and it was playable huh. the, when I made it. So. Um, yeah, kind of went from there. That's that's really cool. And what did you use for uh, making your card prototypes? Like, did you use any software or were you just like kind of cutting sheets of paper? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I did it in Photoshop. Uh, I've been lucky that I learned the Adobe Suite back in college. One of the best classes I ever took in college because uh, that can be very hard to figure out unless someone explains the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, over the years, I kind of stuck with it and always had that in my back pocket. Um, definitely not essential, like there's especially these days, there's a lot of graphics program. The key is uh, if you're using normal poker size cards, two and a half by three and a half inches, you can fit nine of them three by three on an eight and a half and 11 piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So whether you draw on the lines, cut them out like that. It's really super easy to get that on there. Um, but I just plopped the images and some text into the cards on Photoshop and printed it out and cut it out. Uh, put it in some card sleeves is a great thing because it's easier to shuffle for a game that needs a lot of shuffling and just went from there. Cool, very cool. Um, so what was your playtesting process like and how much playtesting did you do before, you know, before you said, all right, this is pretty good to go? <laughs> the, uh, I would say both a lot and I'm kind of amazed that I didn't have to do more with it, at least right in the beginning. The core of it came together surprisingly quickly, which was great. Uh, I was very fortunate to be here in Seattle when I was working on the game uh, when I'm trying to think because I think exactly where the timelines intersected this was around the time that I started to meet other local awesome board game designers and there was a kind of defunct Facebook group for tabletop designers and so I dove in there and kind of took it over with permission I said hey can I start doing <laughs> some events from this existing group Posting to that group, also just chatting with some people locally I had met at places like Evergreen Tabletop Expo, and I was able to launch weekly playtest events. Uh, so I had access to playtesters every single week, which was amazing. And you know, shout out to the Seattle Tabletop Game Designers. So many amazing games have come from here over the last few years. It's been uh, really mind blowing. But so I was able to get some tests in there get some tests at home, either with friends or with my husband. And I, <laughs> I started pitching it super early, which is, which just blows my mind. Uh, like it was like a month that PAX Unplugged came up mm -hmm. and I was already reaching out. That's when I first reached out to Game Right, who is the publisher of Abandoned All Artichokes. So gosh, I just, <laughs> almost just the cockiness of it, you know, like a month in <laughs> development. I'm like, I didn't think anything would come of it though. Right, you know, I was just right. like, you know, I just, just, shoot my shot, you know, get some stuff out there and see what happens. And they, they bit, you know, yeah, I sent out an yeah. email and they were interested. So yeah, there was a lot That's of cool. testing after that, but the very first iteration came together pretty seamlessly. Cool. And I mean, it has such a hooky name, you know, that kind of like really <laughs> draws people in clearly too. Well, it was, it was funny because 
I I liked the name, but I realized it's honestly kind of obnoxious or it's a lot to put on a box, right? So I told them halfway through, I'm like, you can change the name. Like, you're not beholden to that. They're like, no, the name is the best part of this game. Uh, and it has consist. it's been, it, it does resonate with people. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I love the, the tin that it comes in too. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. It, it's, uh. yeah, I love it. Um, at what point did you start like writing, like documenting rules for abandoned all artichokes? Pretty early on, actually. The, it's really interesting if you talk to different designers. Some, uh, even when they get to publishers, the publishers kind of have to pry it out of them, and some people really don't like the part of writing down rules. But I don't super trust my memory. Yeah. <laughs> so for a lot, I make lists all the time. I just everything that I want to remember, I make sure I put it down in a place because I'm so worried that I'll forget it. So I, I write my rules pretty early on because I'm just so worried that I'll get distracted. <laughs> and totally then be like, how wait, how did this game work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and I also have a background among many other things of both writing and technical writing. So uh, I used to write software manuals. So that kind of rhythm of do X and then do Y is pretty firmly embedded in my brain. And I have a template now too. So I find for me, it's pretty easy just to start to plug things in there. And the sooner you get stuff down, you can always go back and iterate on it. And then if and when you get to publication, you have that document ready. And for me, I find it just makes it a lot easier. Plus my games tend to be pretty simple. If you're doing a three hour Euro game, I imagine the rules are a little more <laughs> obnoxious to work on, uh, but not so much for my games. Cool, cool. So what were like, what do you think were some of your biggest challenges that you faced when you were designing or like kind of going through that development process? <laughs> I'm working on a game right now that hasn't been announced and kind of in that same place with it. So it, it's really interesting to see how it just cycles back around. I think often coming up with a first idea and getting it down there and it works just feels so good and so powerful and positive. You feel like a genius. You feel like the smartest person in the world. I made this. People are having fun with it. It totally works. Uh, and then for me, at least, there's often this process of honing and discovering and perfecting, I guess we would say, but it's never really perfect. Um, but I just, it's really important to me for games, they should be fun. They should be free flowing. You know, they don't have to be perfect. You don't want any game to be 100% balanced because it's going to be boring. But consistency is really important for me. So I want as many people as possible to have the same good feelings and good experiences from this game. And that really requires uh, a lot of testing, a lot of math, and a lot of balancing and kind of play testing and really seeing people's experiences and listening really closely to the people who don't have as much fun with it or who are frustrated with it. Uh, and that can be pretty tough, you know, to hear that, especially you just had a play test. This person loved it. Uh, it's been like this kid loved it. It's perfect. You know, I don't need to make any changes. And then you test again and this person is really just stuck on a thing. And in the back of your mind, you can go to this place of, Maybe they're wrong, maybe it's just them and all these things, but um, the, this quote when I was interviewing Richard Garfield who designed Magic the Gathering always sticks with me. He says he likes to play games he doesn't like until he knows why the people who love those games love them because they're not wrong. You know, mm. anyone who's having experience with a game is not wrong. Their feelings are justified and valid, you know, yeah. so really working on a game to find those little hooks and things. Yeah. And sometimes that's a little change and sometimes it's overhauling the whole entire game because the assumptions you made in the beginning weren't correct. And you don't know what the answer is. You don't know when it will all come together. So you're right. just kind of floating and it's like, is it going to take a week? Is it going <laughs> to take a year? You know, it's right. a very kind of right. uncertain place to be. Yeah, I'm I'm working on a game too, and I I know exactly where you're coming from with that. Yeah. Um. So, did you have any like aha moments along the way? You know, where something was just like, yeah, like that feels great. Absolutely. And it's funny because you don't 
usually know in the moment that that's going to be an aha moment. Sometimes you do, but sometimes only on looking back at it, do you realize what a pivotal turning point that was for abandoned all artichokes. One of the big ones was really cutting out, uh, costs for the cards and making everything flat and equally valuable. So in the first iterations of the game, there were two markets, which is the garden. Now you would mm-hmm. get the, uh, the fruits would be the, the cheaper cards and you could buy those by discarding an artichoke. Uh, and then the, the vegetables would be the more expensive market and you could buy those by discarding a fruit. So you would kind of invest and grow up into better cards because the kind of an engine buildy thing is what a lot of deck builders have. And a couple problems with that. First, you were discarding the artichokes that you want to get rid of. So it really slowed down the game. Mm-hmm. And you were discarding then the cards you actually did actions with. Again, really slowing down the game. The whole point is getting them in your hands. So you can actually use them. Right. And it was just taking a very long time to do all this. So made it back to a single market, which meant every card had to be roughly equal in desirability, which is a very big design challenge. And then... You just got one for free every turn. So completely getting rid of costs and currency, cards going straight into your hand. And that was very early on in development and very different from, I think, every deck builder I've ever played. Most of them go in your discard. And it's, again, kind of this slow burn, slow build, which can be very fun, too. But, again, I wanted this to be quick and snappy Mm -hmm. and high impact. So I get this card. I get to use it right away was a pretty big innovation. The third one, I would say, is a constant battle with card draw. And uh, I play a lot of Magic the Gathering, a lot of other deck-type games. Card draw is so good, so powerful. I love card draw. More Mm -hmm. cards, more resources. It's so fun. It feels so good. And it just didn't work in Abandoned All Artichokes because of the economy and because actions. Cards don't cost anything. Actions don't cost anything. Right. Uh, One of the first play tests I had, we ran into the infinite potato problem where the (laughs) potatoes would draw cards and then they would get shuffled back in your deck. It's like, and the person plays like, look, I could just go through my deck over and over again. This (laughs) is, I was just like, yeah, no, (laughs) they're like this. I'm having a great time. Like, yeah, (laughs) that's not the way it's supposed to go. (laughs) Yeah. No one else is having a good time. So, right. Right. Yeah. Just having, I was like, what if I nerf it and make it worse and worse and worse and eventually just, Yeah. Gone yeah, it, and it's crazy, like, hearing you talk about all this, you know, as you're playing this, like, 20-minute card game that's, like, pretty easy to learn, pretty easy to play, and just, like, how much goes into the design process of making it that way is just, it's crazy, you know? Like, people, don't, I don't think a lot of people really even understand, you know, can understand how much of design work had to go into like getting it to be as smooth and quick as it is you know so it's yeah it's it's really cool to hear you like break it break it all down (laughs) absolutely and i would say simple approachable card games are some of the hardest games to design especially as more and more just absolutely amazing ones come out the market has so many games that, that i love and that are so tight and satisfying that making the, the bar is very high you know mm-hmm. so making something that has a very wide age, age range of play that's pretty easy to teach um that's that stays interesting and stays replayable is mm-hmm. uh a, a very fascinating challenge um some of the cards some of the games i've played recently or not so recently push fantasy realms point salad you know sushi go old favorite cat lady all of these things yeah. they're just Games are so amazing these days. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 tot- I totally agree. So so the artwork on the cards in Abandon All Artichokes is so adorable. I love how like the different vegetables have different expressions. Uh, how were the art and graphic design decisions made? So that was pretty much 100% game right and Bonnie Pang. Uh, I wasn't part of the art direction process of it, but they showed me the images pretty early on and for for the art itself. And I said, yeah, no comment. (laughs) 
<laughs> you're doing great. I'm just, and art direction, honestly, is for me one of the hardest parts, I think, of game design, of board game design, mm-hmm. you know, and probably because I'm less familiar with it, but it's, especially as someone without and as much of an art background, trying to communicate with an artist, and artists are just, amazing interpreters because people will say stuff I want it to look I want it to feel happy you know it's just I just want it to be more cool you know yeah. the language non-artists use is infuriating I'm sure to to artists trying to really get at what it is but Bonnie Pang really managed to nail the intersection of cute and still not cutesy cute and not cutesy right so right. the the kind of watercolor-ish look makes it, because they're cute, they're cute, cute vegetables, uh, and it really easily could have gone to this is a game for children, you know, and yeah. it is, it's ten plus, it's it's a lot of kids get it, but it's definitely has some complexity to it. So, I think the art communicates that, and uh, it's important to make sure that consumers can buy the game that fits to them. I think art's a really important part of that. Yeah, and I, I totally, I think you guys nailed that, like, that cute versus cutesy. Um, yeah. Because it is cute, but it doesn't feel like, oh, this is just a little kitty game, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's that's really cool. So when did you know um, the game was finished? <laughs> oh, gosh. It's not, never. <laughs> I, is it finished, really? The... <laughs> Uh, and this is why I really like working with publishers and every publisher I've worked with has just been such a great relationship because they, I won't say necessarily they know when it's finished, but they have the deadline. You you know, they do the math of we want it to come out here. So we have to lock yeah. in this here. So you have to be done with this here. And they just say like, this is the deadline. It needs to be done. <laughs> so you're like, okay, uh, I guess it's done. I I had a pretty long runway with Artichokes, so I think from start to finish, it was about two years of development, and it was nice because I was working on it. Uh, We didn't sign the contract until like a year and a half, almost two years in, so there was a lot of back and forth with GameRight where I would work on things and play test and come back to them, so they were seeing it evolve over time, and they liked the direction that it was going in. I liked the direction it was going in. And it got to the point where I had tried so many different card powers and combinations of things. It just felt tight and good and solid. You know, I would never say that it felt perfect. I think even as even as we locked it down, I, I just like, oh, no, is it really ready? Is this it? <laughs> right. Yeah, but with any art or creations, like you, at some point you just got to get it out there. You know, yeah. you can work on it for 10 years and never say that it's done, and then you'll just never make anything, right? right? Uh, but I really felt that I'd wrung everything out of card powers, and I even got to the point where I don't know how I could even make anything new, because this, this is it. It's working. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it's cool, because coming back to it now... Uh, a year, I don't know what time is anymore, two years later, (laughs) a year and a half later, uh, I'm starting to look at potential expansion possibilities. No, no, no confirmation, nothing set in stone (laughs) yet, but I'm playing around with new card ideas and all of a sudden just ideas are pouring forth. So coming at it from a distance, I'm like, ha, it wasn't done. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I can come back to it. That's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah, give it give it some time to breathe and you come back with yeah. fresh ideas. That's cool. Absolutely. Um, so, do you I know this is maybe not your first game um that you created or that you've even had published, but do you have any advice for someone who would be interested in created may, maybe their first card game? Yeah. Oh gosh, it's every time I hear like hearing that you're working on a game, it my heart just swells and gets bigger because I I love people making games. I love new people making games. And uh, I recently started reaching out on Facebook just to my wider networks to look for play testers because the game I'm working on right now is a mass market game. So I'm looking for uh, non-designers to play test. But it turns out a lot of people who sign up for the play test or want to experience it have designed games or they, they just mention it, you know, we're play testing. They're like, that was fun. You know, I'm kind of working on a game and how That's often cool. it comes up 
is is so cool. And then I can say, that's that's awesome. You know, I'm so happy that you're doing this. And it's, you know, my husband's cousins or something. I'm like, you're making games? I didn't even know that. Or some <laughs> like college friends uh, and all that. And you're not alone. There's so many people every single day that decide that they want to make games. Uh, my advice is it changes over time. And I think where I've come down most recently is do it for yourself. Uh, I think a lot of people kind of get caught up in it and they make a game and it's fun and their friends are having fun and they pretty quickly jump to, oh, maybe I can get this published or maybe it can be a thing or maybe I can make some money off of it. And uh, definitely people do. And I don't want to dissuade anyone from that avenue, but I think sometimes people get so caught up in that aspect of it that they lose kind of that initial fun and joy of just the creative process. And I think it's, if you want to go down that path, it's a commitment and it's a lot of work and there's a lot of research and a lot of steps. It's like with anything, with getting a, a book published uh, or if you self-publish, you know, there's a whole world out there and it's it's kind of a lot and it's can be fun and interesting, but it can also be hard and, and kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> so yeah. if you, if you make a game and your your family enjoys it and your friends enjoy it, like that's awesome. You made a game. Like you're you're great and you're a hero for having done that. And print off a few copies, give it to your friends, play it at family gatherings, and as much as you can, really just be in the joy of the experience of creation. And it doesn't always have to be something. It still matters and it still has a lot of value, even if your friends and your family are the only ones who enjoy it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for joining me today on Cardboard Creations. It was it was really cool to hear the backstory behind uh, all, Abandon All Artichokes. Is there anything that you're working on that you'd like to mention that we should be looking out for or even anything else coming down the pike for Abandon All Artichokes besides that, that potential <laughs> expansion? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm pretty in the weeds right now for in progress projects. Nothing really to announce other than check out Abandon All Artichokes. There's so many ways that you can uh, play the game, buy the game, enjoy the game with friends, and it continues to explode, which blows my mind and makes me so happy. There's uh, a lot of digital implementations of the game. Board Game Arena has a great one. Tabletopia has an awesome one. Uh, and these are uh, licensed and verified by game right so they're all don't feel bad about playing them they're not rip-offs or anything <laughs> and and i love these because it really makes it easy and approachable for people to hop into the game learn the rules and you might find you love that implementation or you might find after playing it it's not for you which is great or you might find that you like it you want to try it in the actual physical version uh and which you can do in English and in other languages as well. The other really exciting thing is language, uh, international language copies continue to come out cool. and it's really spreading, which has been fun and exciting for me. Uh, a couple of my favorites are Alcachofas No Gracias, which is the Spanish version, uh, and that's Artichokes No Thanks. So uh, just seeing how the interpretations of the title yeah. are, are really fun. Another one of my favorites is uh, Artichoke Nate Dai Kirai, which is the Japanese version. People always ask me if how I feel about artichokes, if artichokes hurt me, and I, I love artichokes, I have nothing against them, but the <laughs> Japanese title actually translates to I hate artichokes, so it's kind oh. of like a, a joke played on me for, for people. I'm going to become the, the artichoke hater. And then the tagline <laughs> is... Uh, operation to eliminate all vegetables without justice. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love seeing all the ways that um, the, the how it's perceived in different languages is really cool. So, that's cool. If you have international friends, you can check that out. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. Thank you all for watching Cardboard Creations. Hopefully it's been as inspiring and fascinating for you as it has been for me. And remember, the only way to get something done is to start doing it. Mm -hmm.